information in this video is based on the most current information available at the time of production. While Affordable Safety Training works hard to make sure these materials are current, the employer has sole responsibility for compliance with all laws, regulations, and standards. This video is sold with the understanding that AST is not providing professional or legal advice. Employers should have a reliable source for current regulatory information and best practices. Falls are the leading cause of death in the workplace. Fatal fall accidents account for about 30% of workplace fatalities. In construction, falls cause about 40% of worker deaths. About one quarter of fatal fall accidents are from falls that occur on the same working level. The frequency of fatal falls has been rising steadily. In the most recent census of fatal occupational injuries, fatal falls reached an all-time high of 887. About a quarter million workers each year are injured from falls. It is the responsibility of the employer to identify fall hazards. Eliminate fall hazards. If the fall hazard cannot be eliminated, the employer must provide equipment, training, and procedures to protect employees from falls. The objectives of this course are to understand the regulatory requirements for fall protection, understand the basics of fall protection, understand the types of fall protection systems, understand the methods for selecting, inspecting, using, and storing personal fall protection equipment. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration often has different sets of regulations for different work types. The two most common standards are for construction and general industry. This can be a bit confusing because the term construction and general industry actually refer to the type of work being performed, not the industry it is being performed in. Here is how OSHA defines construction work. Construction work means work for construction, alteration, and, or, repair, including painting, and decorating. OSHA considers general industry work to be any work that does not fall under the definitions of construction, agriculture, or maritime. So, it is entirely possible for a worker in a warehouse to perform construction work, while an employee of a construction company could be performing general industry work. Employers and employees must know the classification of the work being performed, and refer to the appropriate regulations. If the employer cannot determine how to classify the work, the employer must follow the more protective standard. In construction work, employees must have fall protection when working six feet or greater above a lower level. For general industry work, employees working four feet or greater above a lower level must be protected from falls. Fall protection is also required at any height if there is a danger of falling into hazardous equipment. There are many options available for fall protection. The employer will select the method of fall protection that best matches the hazards of the work area. Guardrails systems are commonly used for fall protection. Guardrails must meet stringent design specifications. The top rail must be between 39 and 45 inches high. Top rails must be able to withstand an applied force of at least 200 pounds. Mid rails must be placed halfway between the top rail and the working surface, and must withstand a force of at least 150 pounds. Guardrails must also be designed so they do not cause cuts or injuries, and should not extend past terminal posts. Covers are used to block holes in floors, roofs, and other working surfaces. They must be able to withstand at least twice the weight of the maximum expected load. 
Covers must be color-coded, or marked with the word hole, or cover, to provide warning of the fall hazard. Safety nets are designed to catch a falling worker. Safety nets should be installed as close as possible underneath the working level, but no more than 30 feet below. The distance a safety net must extend out from the building depends on the distance from the working level to the net. A potential fall of up to 5 feet requires an 8-foot extension. A potential fall of 5 to 10 feet requires a 10-foot extension. A potential fall of more than 10 feet requires a 13-foot extension. There must be enough space under a safety net to ensure a person falling into the net does not strike a surface below it. Safety nets must pass a drop test. After immediate installation. After a major repair. And at least every six months. Positioning devices allow workers to connect to an anchorage point and work with both hands free. The positioning device must allow no more than two feet of free fall, and it must be able to hold 3,000 pounds, or twice the expected load, whichever is greater. The purpose of a personal fall arrest system is to safely stop the fall of a worker. A personal fall arrest system consists of four components. A harness. Connectors. Anchor points. And a rescue plan. The body harness is designed to distribute the arresting force of a fall across your body. This arresting force must be limited to 1,800 pounds or less. A connector is a device used to connect the parts of the fall arrest system. Carabiners, snaphooks, lanyards, deceleration devices, and lifelines are all examples of connectors. Connectors must be corrosion resistant, be made of steel, and have smooth surfaces and edges to prevent damaging components or injuring employees. Connectors must have a minimum strength of at least 5,000 pounds. Connecting devices must be double acting, and self locking. Connectors must be set up to limit the maximum free fall to 6 feet or less, and prevent contact with a lower level. The personal fall arrest system must be connected to an anchor point. Anchor points must be able to support at least 5,000 pounds, per employee attached. That is roughly the weight of a pickup truck, for each employee attached. Anchor points must be designated by a qualified person. The last fall arrest system component is the rescue plan. The employer must provide for prompt rescue in the event of a fall, or must ensure that employees are able to rescue themselves. Warning lines are designed to alert workers they are approaching an unprotected edge. Warning lines are allowed for work on low sloped roofs, and must always be used with another fall protection system, such as guardrail systems, safety net systems, personal fall arrest system, or safety monitoring system. Warning lines must be erected on all sides of the roof work area, no less than 6 feet away from the roof edge. When mechanical equipment is used, the warning line system may need to be 10 feet away, depending on the configuration of the equipment. Points of access, material handling areas, storage areas, and hoisting areas, must be connected to the work area by an access path of two warning lines. The warning lines must be flagged at no more than six-foot intervals. Employees may not cross the warning line, unless a worker is performing roofing work in the area. Controlled access zones are allowed for certain types of work, such as overhand bricklaying. Controlled access zones are like warning line systems, except that secondary fall protection systems are not required, and certain authorized employees may cross the barrier. Controlled access zones must extend the entire length of the unprotected edge, and must be connected on each side to a guardrail system or wall. Safety monitoring systems use a designated competent person whose sole responsibility is to monitor the safety of employees. They must warn workers when they are working in an unsafe manner. The safety monitor must be on the same working surface and be close enough to be heard by the worker. Employees must follow all instructions of safety monitors immediately. For general industry work on low sloped roofs, the employer may use designated areas. These areas must be marked with a warning line. 
For temporary or infrequent work, the barrier must be erected no less than 6 feet from the unprotected edge. For other work, the barrier must be at least 15 feet from the unprotected edge. Locating instructor. Instructor located. Jeremy Norton. Education. Graduate, U.S. Navy Nuclear Power School. OSHA 10 and 30 hour instructor. Certified Safety Specialist, University of Washington. Masters in Business Administration, Portland State University. Associates in Applied Science, Bachelors in Science, Business. Experience. Training Petty Officer, USS Carl Vinson Reactor Department. U.S. Navy Nuclear Mechanic. Training Manager, Synetics Solutions. Technical Trainer, Vestas Wind Power. North American Training Manager, Iberdrola Renewables. Founder and President, Affordable Safety Training LLC. Hello, my name is Jeremy Norton. Throughout my career, fall protection has been critical to my safety. Whether it's climbing down to the depths of a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier or hundreds of feet in the air to the top of a wind turbine, my very life has relied on the effective and safe use of fall protection systems. So today we're gonna to cover selection, inspection, use, maintenance, and storage of fall protection systems. We'll also go over some safe work practices, talk about a couple of tips, and maybe throw in an interesting story or two. So let's get started. The fall protection hierarchy is the order of preference for protecting employees from fall hazards. When selecting a protection method, start at the bottom, and if that is not available, work your way on up. The preferred method for dealing with fall hazards is to eliminate them with engineering controls. Performing the work on the ground or using extensions are both examples of engineering controls. If engineering controls cannot be implemented, the next step is to use passive fall protection systems. Passive systems, such as guardrails or covers, provide a physical barrier between the worker and the unprotected edge. Passive systems do not require any special equipment or training to use. The next preferred option is fall restraint. Now fall restraint looks an awful lot like fall arrest. It often uses the same equipment. Fall restraint systems use fall protection equipment to eliminate the possibility of an employee reaching an unprotected edge. Since fall restraint systems eliminate the possibility of a fall, it is notably absent in OSHA fall protection regulations. Now all the way back in 1995, when Toy Story was killing it at the box office, OSHA released a letter of interpretation on fall restraint systems. They said that fall restraint may be used, and they recommended that the minimum strength of the system be 3,000 pounds or twice the amount of force necessary to restrain somebody. To use a fall restraint system, employees need special training on the equipment, just like fall arrest. Active systems use special equipment to stop or arrest a fall. Personal fall arrest systems and safety net systems are examples of active systems. Active systems require special equipment and training for employees. Now, since active systems allow for the possibility of a fall, the employer must create a rescue plan for employees who have fallen. Administrative controls use warning indicators and procedures to protect employees from fall hazards. Designated areas, warning line systems, safety monitoring systems, and controlled access zones are all examples of administrative controls. Now, administrative controls are the least preferred method because they require extraordinary attention, supervision, and training to be effective. Administrative controls provide no barrier between the worker and the fall hazard and can only be used for certain unique work conditions. So when working with fall hazards, use the fall protection hierarchy to select a protective method that best meets the needs of your work area. Remember the order of preference, engineering controls, passive systems, restraint systems, active systems, and administrative systems. When working at heights, it is important to select the right fall protection equipment for the hazard. Now your employer will select the fall protection systems to be used, but it's up to you to pick the individual components that best meet the fall protection needs for your situation. Fall protection harnesses distribute the arresting and restraining forces from a fall protection system across your body. Um, when selecting a fall protection harness, there's a lot of things to consider. Uh, the first is its fit. Does it fit you properly? Different body types have different requirements. Some people will, will work fine with these type of strap type harnesses, and some people require different solutions. When selecting a harness, it's important to have different options available. 
Comfort is another important factor when selecting a fall protection harness. Just like any other piece of personal protective equipment, the more comfortable it is, the more likely it is to be worn every day. Lots of different types out there. Um, there's the like cloth types you'll see a lot with the padding all around. Uh, those are really popular. I used to, uh, I used to use those, uh, and then I noticed that on the job site, they had a tendency to kind of get up and wander off on their own um, when I put mine down. So now I've just gone back to being comfortable with the more standard strap type harnesses. But try a bunch on and see what fits most comfortably for you. You also need to consider what type of protection system you'll be connecting to. The back day ring is for fall arrest and fall restraint. If you are using a harness for positioning, you will need side D-rings. If you are using a climbing system, you will need a front D-ring. The correct intended use for harness components may vary, so check your owner's manual. Suspension trauma is another thing to consider when selecting a fall protection harness. Suspension trauma is the damage that occurs to your body from hanging in a harness for a long period of time. Now some harnesses will have suspension straps already built into the harness, or you can actually go to a safety supply store and pick up a little uh, suspension trauma strap system that you can attach right here onto your harness. And if you ever fall, you'll have that suspension trauma strap there to stand in while you're waiting for rescue. Now connectors connect your body harness to the fall protection system. Now there are a lot of things to consider when selecting connectors. The first thing is you need to select connectors that limit your potential free fall to six feet or less. Now there are two main ways to do this. One is by selecting the length or type of your connector, and the other is by selecting the height of your anchor point. Now, since we're worried about equipment selection right now, that's what we're gonna focus on. The six foot lanyard, like this one, is one of the most common lanyards found on the job site. Now, this means that if you're anchored at shoulder height and you fall with a six foot lanyard, you'll have a free fall distance of six feet. Now, if you're anchored below your shoulder height when you fall, you'll exceed the maximum free fall distance of six feet and potentially injure yourself. So if you don't actually need a six foot lanyard, consider going with a shorter four foot lanyard or a retractable lanyard system. I have a favorite three foot lanyard that I take with me everywhere I go. The shorter the lanyard, the shorter the potential free fall distance and the less chance of getting injured in the event of a fall. Now connectors must be double acting and self locking. Double acting means it takes two distinct motions to open the connector, and self-locking means that when you release it, it automatically returns to a locked position. Are you connecting to a fall arrest system? A 200 pound person falling six feet will generate about 4,000 pounds of arresting force on their body. Now OSHA requires that the arresting force be limited to 1,800 pounds or less. So the way they do this is by incorporating shock absorbers. Now shock absorbers are commonly seen in lanyards. You'll see uh, the kind of the bungee type or the rip stitch pack. And sometimes shock absorbers are actually incorporated into the equipment themselves, into the mechanisms inside self-retracting lifelines, for example. But it's really important if you are connecting to a fall arrest system that you make sure that your connector has a shock absorber. Occasionally you're gonna find lanyards out there that do not have shock absorbers. Now those lanyards are fine to use for positioning or restraint but since they don't have shock absorbers in there, they cannot be used for fall arrest. Anchor points need to be selected and or installed by a qualified person. Now there's lots of different equipment out there available for, for anchor points. You can install an anchor point into a roof, truss, windowsill, structural member, really anywhere that's strong enough to hold 5,000 pounds per person attached. Your employer will designate and inform you of the proper anchor points to use. So there are a lot of things to consider when selecting fall protection equipment. If you require any assistance, check the owner's manual or ask a supervisor. Personal fall arrest systems need to be inspected prior to each use. A periodic inspection by a competent person is also required. Now ANSI recommends these periodic inspections be done at least annually, but check your equipment owner's manual because their requirements are often more frequent. The best place to get inspection requirements is from the owner's manual for the equipment that you are using. You can also often find it on the tag or label. Whenever I showed up to a site, I'd head straight to the Connex and start going through the fall protection equipment and I would just yank anything out of there that I didn't like. Uh, I ended up with a great collection of terrible fall protection equipment for that. And we're gonna use some of those examples to go through some sample inspections. So let's walk through a fall protection harness inspection. The first thing to look for on a fall protection harness is does it have a label? Now this is true across the board with all safety equipment. If it doesn't have a label, or if that label is not readable, you can't use it. Doesn't matter how good a condition the actual equipment is in, you have to have that label and it must be legible. 
Now in this case, the label is pretty dirty, it's pretty worn, but it's there and it's readable. So let's check out the webbing on the harness. Uh, so the first thing you want to do is grab the webbing about six to eight inches apart and kind of bend it. Now bending it will allow you to see the damage easier, but it'll also get you a feel for the actual structure of the, of the webbing and any brittleness that occurred from like sunlight exposure or chemical exposure will show up as you bend it and you'll really get a good feel for it. So bend it and pass the straps, all of the straps, all the way through your hands as you take a look at it. You want to look for cuts, nicks, any type of discoloration, um, broken stitching, damaged webbing, all sorts of um, damage that could potentially happen. You can see here there's a, a cut in the side and a nick. There's some abrasion right here that's damaged the webbing. Um, there's all sorts of stuff in here. This kind of looks a little bit like cigarette burns from the ash. Um, yeah, there's lots of damage in here. Now, chemical damage will often show up as uh, stains or dark spots on the webbing. You can actually see that a lot right here. Oh, you can actually smell damage too. The smell, it kind of, you get kind of an earthy type of kind of rotten smell. That's, you can tell that it's been damaged. Um, sunlight will bleach the harness, um, bleach it white or take the color away and also make it kind of brittle. Um, yeah, just from looking at the webbing of this harness out here, I really am not liking what I'm seeing. There's some serious discoloration, there's some damage, there's some cuts, nicks, all sorts of brittleness. Um, so based on this webbing alone, this harness is dead to me. You can see why I pulled it out of service. So now let's inspect the hardware. Now the hardware, basically the metal components and anything that connects the metal components to the harness. So when you're dealing with metal, the first thing you want to check for is rust. Now, you old graybeards out there, don't give me any lectures about protective oxide coatings. Uh, it's not protective, it's just rust. And if you see rust, you gotta get it out. Um, and in this example, there's tons of rust right here inside the D-rings. Buckles are all rusted. Um, some very, very heavily rusted. You, I mean, if you find rust, that's it. You gotta get it out of service. Now check the hardware to make sure that it can move freely. We're gonna check the D-ring, check the buckles here. Now, if you're using tongue buckles, you want to make sure that the tongue buckles, that the straps can move through the tongue buckle freely and that the grommets aren't out of round or damaged in any way. So take a look at all the hardware components and just make sure they're in good condition and that there's no distortions on any of the components. So the last thing you want to check on a harness is to see if that has been involved in a fall. Now, most harnesses have some sort of impact indicators on there. A lot of them you'll find in the actual webbing. Um, here's an example. You can see that this uh, part of the webbing has been folded over onto itself and then stitched closed. So if this part has been torn open, you can tell that this harness has been involved in a fall. Another one that's really common is on the back of the back D-ring, this plastic uh, slotting here. Up here, this will be, get distorted or just break off altogether. And that's the sign that the equipment has been in a fall. And also just checking the actual hardware components themselves. If the back D-ring is stretched or out of round or any of the buckles have been bent or pulled out of shape, that's another example of a harness being impact loaded. If there's any sign at all that your harness has been involved in a fall, you have to remove it from service. So let's do some connector inspections. I've got something really exciting here for you guys. I call this one the Widowmaker. I've actually pulled this out of service uh, several times. Um, it is a twin lanyard, retractable lanyard system with rebar hooks. So just like any other piece of safety equipment, the first thing we're going to do is check for the label. Now this has the label. It's right here on the back. You can see everything is legible. It's a little bit scratched up and dinged up. There's a label under here that's also scratched up, but it's still readable. So the labels are present. So connectors that extend and contract have mechanisms inside that need to be checked. There's two basic checks for checking the mechanisms. One is just to make sure that it functions properly and it pulls out nice and smooth as it's intended. So you can see it right here you can pull it out. Coming out nice and smooth, you want to pull out the entire length of the lanyard. So it comes all the way out. Oh, there's all sorts of dust and oof. I mean, yikes, dust coming out of there. And then it retracts nice and smooth. So let's go ahead and pull on the other one as well. So coming out nice and smooth. Looking at the, oh, there is dust and grime coming out of this. That is not good. But pulling out the mechanism all the way out to the end, all the way back. Yeah, the mechanism was working fine as far as extension and retraction. So the next thing you need to check is the braking mechanism. This is the mechanism that stops the device when you fall. So you can just grab it up here nice and solid and give it a good pull. Oh, yikes, that did not stop at all. Oh, okay, this is not working. Let's try the other one. Okay, yeah, see, sure tug on this one and the braking mechanism happens on this one. 
that plunging to your death. So this one definitely does not pass the inspection. So now let's inspect the webbing. You can see here, uh, it's old, it's a little bit worn. There's some dirt here, if that kind of concerns me. It looks like there's some grime and dirt, maybe a little oil there. Um, but you wanna inspect the webbing, make sure there's no broken stitching, cuts, nicks, all that type of stuff. And then like we talked about, we need to pull this device all the way out and look at every single piece. Now, if you have a long self-retracting lifeline, so like a 20 or 30 footer, you're gonna need somebody to help pull this out with you so you guys can take a look the entire length of that. You wanna do that for both legs. And the webbing on this one, like I said, is a little bit dirty, um, but other than that, it's in pretty good condition. Uh, it doesn't concern me that much. So let's take a look at the hardware. Now, the first thing you wanna do with the hardware is make sure that it functions. Remember, it has to be double acting and self-locking. And then you want to take a look at it, make sure it's not out of round, if there's not any damage, and check for rust. Now this one has the beginnings, it's a little weatherized, and it's got some beginning markings of rust. Um, there's a good tip actually, because a lot of mechanisms that you can't really inspect the inside, but if you listen well, you can really get a feel for how it is on the inside. Um, so rust on rust or rust on metal will often give you a squeaking sound instead of a good metallic, and if you pull it open, and let it go, you want to get a good metallic ring. Now, um, rust on a hardware can deaden that sound and make it kind of a dull thump instead of that big metallic ring. And that can be a sign that there's rust on there. Um, and if you don't forget to inspect the carabiner as well. And if you look up here, you can see there, there's some rust on this one. And I can hear that, that little squeaking. It's not metallic, it's a squeak like a little field mouse. Um, and that's telling me that there's been some rust on the inside of this connector. The connector works okay. Um, but the connector itself is rusted. And the last thing we're gonna check is the load impact indicators. We wanna check to see if this piece of equipment has been involved in a fall. Um, now, retractable lanyards and retractable lifelines, their mechanism is on the inside, uh, so that can be difficult to inspect, but they usually have some sort of indicators on the outside. In this case, there's little tags right here that say load indicators. And there's right here, there's a sewn piece of stitching right there. So if this is involved in a fall, this will tear open and then there'll be a warning sign on these tags right here telling that this has been involved in a fall. Now, these load indicators are not, um, don't say that this has been involved in a fall, but obviously something has happened to this mechanism. So it's another sign that it may be involved in a fall. And of course, the other ones that will tell you if it's been involved in a fall, if there's any type of thing out of round or distorted on the hardware that can tell you that this a piece of equipment has been involved in a fall. So now we've got a different connector to check out. This is a four foot lanyard, yay. I'm a big fan of the shorter lanyards as uh, we've talked about previously. Uh, so same thing applies. First thing you wanna do when you're looking at there is make sure that the label is legible. So we've got the label up here. It says the capacity and all the inspection requirements. So yeah, we've got a label, we're good to go there. Once we've looked at the label, we wanna to check to make sure that the webbing is intact. Now, um, internal uh, shock absorber lanyards, the ones that look like this bungee type that are internal, um, they're a little bit different from standard webbing because the webbing on here is not what takes the force of the fall. It's the, it's the connect the material inside. So the webbing that you're really, really concerned about is up here at the top where it connects to the connector to make sure that this part is not torn or out of round. Um, and then you wanna give it a good inspection all the way through to make sure that there's no signs of damage, no chemical uh, damage, no sunlight damage. And then look at all the um, stitches right here to make sure it's all good. And in this case, it looks pretty good. So we've looked at that, now we're gonna check out the hardware. Uh, same thing, it needs to be double acting, self-locking. Uh, the hardware on this one, uh, I'm looking at it, it sounds metallic, um, it operates very smoothly, I'm not getting that grind from rust. It looks weather beaten and old, but it doesn't actually look rusted, it just looks used. Um, same thing on this one. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with the hardware on this one. And then the other thing we wanna do is check to make sure that it's been impact loaded. Now. Um, the standard rip stitch packs, the little packages of, of um, shock absorbers are different because those are easy to tell because they're just torn open and you know that they've been used. Um, these are a little bit different and there's two ways on the internal shock absorbers to decide to figure out if they've been impact loaded or not. Um, the first one is simply at the top here. If you, you'll find it in the user manual, but it'll tell you. There'll be a little tag right here and if it's been impact loaded, the, this thing will tear and this little impact loading tab or danger tab will pull out telling you that this has been damaged. And then also there's a note up here that says you can just measure this lanyard and it extends more than two inches past its original length of four, of four feet. It's been involved in a fall and can't be used. So here we have a great piece of fall protection equipment, right? 
Webbing looks great, it looks brand new, all the stitching's in place, there's no chemical burns or damage. Uh, mechanisms are double acting, self-locking, they're in good shape, but we do have a problem. There's no label on this thing, no label at all over the whole lanyard. Now, all fall protection equipment has to be labeled. Now, since there's no label on this, this tells me this is probably not designed for fall protection. It's either for hoisting or some other type of climbing. Um, so yeah, you can't use this without a label. And even if it did have a label, it's missing something else. It doesn't have a shock absorber. With no shock absorber, you can't use it for fall arrest. You could still use it for positioning or for fall restraint, but since there's no way to absorb the shock of a fall, you can't use it for fall arrest. So since this isn't a piece of fall protection equipment, we need to get rid of it. Select a harness that fits and is designed for the fall protection system in use. Hold by the back D-ring with chest strap facing forward and untangle straps. Pull on the shoulder straps. Insert one arm and then the other. Pull a leg strap between the legs, tighten, and fasten. Repeat with the other leg strap. Fasten, tighten, and adjust the chest strap. Start the five-point harness fit test. 1. The chest strap is centered on the chest. The shoulder straps cannot be pulled over the shoulders. 2. It is difficult, but not impossible, to slide your fingers under the leg straps. 3. The sub-pelvic strap is firmly under the buttocks. 4. When flipped up, the dorsal D-ring is below the bottom of the neck. 5. The overall fit of the harness is snug, with no twists, or loose components. One of the most important and underrated aspects of using a fall arrest system is selecting an anchor point, so that's where we're going to start. Now anchor points need to be installed or designated by a qualified person, but what anchor point you choose and how you connect to it is going to be up to you. One of the most common errors I see in fall protection isn't that they're not wearing the equipment, it's that they're not actually high enough off the ground. What I mean by this is if they were to fall, they'd actually hit the ground before the fall arrest equipment stopped the fall. So this brings up the critically important concept of required clearance. Required clearance is the minimum distance necessary between the working level and the level below to prevent contact in the event of a fall. And this distance is much, much larger than you might expect. Here's an example. A worker wearing a six foot lanyard anchored at shoulder height will require at least 17 and a half feet of clearance between the working level and the level below to prevent contact in the event of a fall. So let's break this down. Required clearance equals the free fall distance plus the deceleration distance plus the harness gather plus the height of the back D-ring plus the safety factor. Now the free fall distance is the only component of this that we can really control, so let's explore that one further. Your free fall distance is the length of your lanyard plus or minus the distance between your connection point and your anchor point. So if you're connected above your back D-ring, you subtract that distance from your free fall distance. If you're anchored below your back D-ring, you add that distance to your free fall distance. So let's take a look at this knucklehead and calculate a required clearance. Now you'll notice he's using a six foot lanyard and he's anchored about five feet below his back D-ring. So that gives us a potential free fall distance of 11 feet, which is well in excess of the legal limit of six. Now you add another three and a half feet for deceleration distance, add another foot for harness gather, add another five feet for the height of the back D-ring, and two feet for a safety factor, and you end up with a required clearance of 22 and a half feet. Now he is not 22 and a half feet off the ground, so if he falls, he's gonna hit the ground. So before we move away from this example, I wanna point out something that I see quite frequently and is very, very dangerous. If you look at the vertical lifeline, you'll notice that they've routed it over the top of the pump jack scaffold bracing. So if he falls, not only is he going to fall, but that lifeline is going to catch on that bracing and tear the entire scaffolding system down and bring his partner down with it. When using a fall arrest system, you need to make sure you calculate a required clearance distance before starting work. And if your work area is not high enough off the ground, you either need to reconfigure the system or use a different form of fall protection. 
Select anchor points that minimize swing fall. Swing fall occurs when a worker falls and is not directly beneath their anchor point. The horizontal force generated from a swing fall can cause serious injury if the worker strikes an object. Here's an example. These two workers are utilizing a fall arrest system with self-retracting lifelines. Now the worker on the left is working far away from his anchor point. So if he falls, it'll take longer for the self-retracting lifeline to activate, which will increase his free fall distance, and the swing fall could cause him to contact the wall on the lower left. For this scenario, the workers have several options for reducing their swing fall. They could establish work zones on the platform that they must remain in. They could install a horizontal lifeline above the work platform, or they could use mesh equivalent guardrail systems for their pump jack scaffold. Anchor points need to be designated or installed by a qualified person. Anchor points must hold at least 5,000 pounds per employee attached. Remember when selecting an anchor point to select one high enough to meet your required clearance requirements. Also, when performing work, try to stay beneath your anchor point to minimize swing fall. Let's go over fall protection equipment, cleaning, maintenance, and storage. Now you can see here I got a little station set up for cleaning and maintenance. Um, the most important thing is always make sure you're familiar with your owner's manual when it comes to cleaning and maintenance because it'll tell you exactly what to do and what not to do to make sure it keeps your fall protection um, clean and in good condition. So here I've got an old harness from back in my uh, wind turbine days. It is really dirty, has not been cleaned in a long time. So we're gonna take a look at um, cleaning this harness here. Now, what you do when it comes to cleaning your harness equipment, it's pretty simple. You've got a solution here of, of, of mild detergent um, and water. Um, it's important that when you're using a cleaning detergent that you don't use anything with any bleach in it because bleach can be hazardous. Also, most of the uh, owner's manuals say that the temperature for the rinse water shouldn't exceed 170 degrees, some say 160, um, but just keep the temperature um, warm to mild. You don't wanna get it too hot. And so when you're cleaning your harness, what you really want to do is just kind of spot clean it. You can see right here, um, I've got a little kind of bristly brush that's not too hard so it doesn't cause any damage. And I can come over here and get some soap in here and just pull out the harness and start really giving a little wash at the dirty parts. Now when you're cleaning a harness, right, you're just going to do what's called a spot wash, which means you just kind of grab the dirty spots and go over it with a brush or a rag or something like that. Get it nice and clean. Um, dirt is one thing, but you're, what you're really looking for is the um, kind of the more sticky uh, black components, the tar, the, um, the oil, the grease, the grime, that kind of stuff is what you really want to get off the harness because that's the stuff that actually um, causes damage. So you want to go over your harness strap by strap, making sure you get all the pieces nice and clean here. You can see all this dirt that's already coming off right here. Um, so both sides of the strap and go through. Oh, here's, right here's a big, big uh, kind of oily spot right there. You want to get that nice and clean. And then so go over the whole harness and make sure that you get all the grease, all the oil, all the grime off there. Um, and then you can go ahead and just rinse it out. Now what I do is I just have a little bucket here of rinse water and you go in and just dip it in there and get all the soap off. Make sure the water is not too hot. And once you're all done, and just set it aside. All right, so the other thing you have to do is maintenance. Now, fall protection equipment, uh, you're not gonna have to do much maintenance on it just because it's a life-saving equipment, so they're not gonna expect you to do any type of repair. Um, the only thing that I've actually seen that uh, is listed for a maintenance requirement that actually usually doesn't get done is that some of the component manuals will have a requirement for lubricating uh, moving parts. So like this snap hook right here that lubricates it, they'll say 
you should spray it. Some say weekly, some say monthly, some say before a certain amount of uses. It's gonna be different for your component manual, um, but just spraying it with a little WD-40, letting it soak. And really, that's all the kind of maintenance that you're really gonna be expected to do. And if anything is more sophisticated than that, any type of repair, you're gonna to wanna to take it back to your provider and have them do it at the shop. So now you've got your fall protection nice and clean, now it's time to store it. Now your employer will designate an area for storage of fall protection. It needs to be a place that's out of the weather, out of traffic, and most importantly, out of the sunlight. The sunlight is something that most people tend to forget. Sunlight causes embrittlement of components on fall protection systems. So you wanna make sure that your storage area is protected from sunlight. Fall is the leading cause of fatalities in the workplace. Before I step onto the job site, I'm thinking about two things. This is my oldest, Cameron, he's seven. And this is my youngest here, Calvin, he's four. All of us have friends, family, and our employers who are relying on us to get the job done and come home safe each day. For construction, fall protection is required when working six feet or greater above a lower level. For general industry work, fall protection is required when working four feet or greater above a lower level. Fall protection is always required when there is a danger of falling into hazardous equipment. Select the fall protection systems and equipment that are appropriate for the hazards in your work area. Remember the fall protection hierarchy. Engineering controls are the preferred method for dealing with fall protection hazards. If hazards cannot be eliminated with engineering controls, then consider passive systems, restraint systems, active systems, and then administrative systems. Make sure that your fall protection system has sufficient required clearance for your working level. Try to work directly beneath your anchor point to minimize swing fall. Store your fall protection equipment in a designated area that is protected from sunlight and free from other hazardous exposures. If you have any doubt about your safety, there is no doubt. Stop work and consult a supervisor.